Good evening. Welcome to everyone and thank you for being here. My name is Dr. Aliyah Elamine and I am a lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, as well as the faculty co-chair of the Identity, Power and Justice in Education concentration. I am delighted to welcome you to the Institute of Politics and this forum tonight, co-sponsored by the Institutional Anti-Racism and Accountability Project at the Harvard Kennedy School, or IRA for short. This forum closes out IRA's two-day Truth and Transformation convening, which included discussions with leading scholars, organizers, and institutional leaders from throughout the US and globally on what accountability for racial justice institutions looks like in practice. This evening, we have the incredible honor of hearing from one of the United States leading voices on racism and justice in education, Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum. I am personally beyond excited to welcome Dr. Tatum, given how influential her work has been on me and my practice as an educator. In fact, at HGSC, we require every incoming master's student to read one of Dr. Tatum's texts at the start of their master's program because her work helps underlie the causes of racial inequity in schools across the US. And she provides us with concrete tools to actually change how we do our teaching, design our curriculum and engagement of young people as they come into their own identity development. Dr. Tatum is the president emerita of Spelman College and an award-winning psychologist widely known for her expertise on race relations and as a thought leader in higher education. Her 13 years as the president of Spelman College, 2002 to 2015, were marked by innovation and growth and her visionary leadership was recognized in 2013 with the Carnegie Academic Leadership Award. In spring 2017, she was the Mimi and Peter E. Haas Distinguished Visitor at Stanford University. And most recently, she served as the interim president at Mount Holyoke College during the academic year of 2022, 2023. Dr. Tatum will be joined in conversation by IRA's director, Dr. Khalil Gibran Mohammed. Khalil Gibran Mohammed is the Ford Foundation, Ford Foundation Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at Harvard Kennedy School. He directs IRA and is the former director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, a division of the New York Public Library and the world's leading library and archive of global Black history. Before leading the Schomburg Center, Dr. Muhammad was an associate professor at Indiana University. Dr. Muhammad's scholarship examines the broad intersections of racism, economic inequality, criminal justice, and democracy in US history, and is the award-winning author of The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and The Making of Modern Urban America. Just saying all of that makes me really excited. It is bound to be an insightful, rigorous, and thought-provoking conversation. Following the conversation, we will take questions from the audience, so please take notes as you watch our program tonight. You'll be able to drop these into the Q&A feature on the Zoom. So even though we're not all in the room together, I hope you'll use your Zoom emojis, your beautiful smiling faces, or the chat to join me in welcoming Dr. Tatum and Dr. Muhammad to the stage. Thank you so much, Dr. El Amin. And uh, we are grateful for you joining us this evening and for the work that you are doing at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. You mentioned it as, as HGSC. So we've got a, a broader audience out there, both in the webinar and in YouTube. And so just wanted people to know who you are because uh, so much of this work is about legacy building and carrying this work forward. So thank you so much for joining us. And to you, Dr. Tatum, welcome. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I also want to thank Dr. El Amin for the lovely introduction and thank you for the invitation to be part of this wonderful program. Sure. Now, first, uh, so if we were together sitting in the forum, we'd be in two lovely chairs with a, a nice background behind us. And I just would want to share some personal connections here that I didn't realize. Uh, one, of course, that um, not of course, but my wife is a Spelman alum. And so uh, you may not know that, but uh, there is that connection. And two, that you've written about an organization that's near and dear to my wife and me. We live in South Orange, New Jersey. My wife was on the school board at South Orange Maplewood. Her name's Stephanie Lawson Muhammad. And uh, the Community Coalition on Race is a very uh, near and dear organization uh, to us. And we've spent a lot of time supporting their dialogues and the work that they do. Well, that is great to know. I've had the opportunity to be there twice. 
20 years apart. And that's uh, right. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I'm delighted to know those connections. Thank you. Yes, yes. And more generally, you and I've had uh, a conversation about um, how to respond to the challenges of this moment, which we're going to do now together in front of a much bigger audience. Um, so I think the first place to start this conversation, Dr. Tatum, is really where you started, because I'm so struck by your body of work, of which um most people are, of course, familiar with you because of your groundbreaking work, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race in 1997, of which you uh, issued a, an updated and expanded edition uh, 20 years later in 2017. But I wanted to start with you setting the context for what I think will be surprising to some people, certainly those who aren't academics and haven't studied your work, that you start your career uh, teaching Black studies to mostly white students on a course uh, called Group Exploration of Racism. This class is in 1980 at University of California, Santa Barbara. Eventually, the class becomes a psychology of racism. But tell us about the context of why you began in this way, what you set out to achieve in this moment, and how that set the table for the rest of your career. It's a great question, and I, I appreciate your asking me because really it was um, very serendipitous. I, I am a clinical psychologist by training. I started my graduate experience at the University of Michigan, which is where I completed my PhD. But in the middle of that process, I got married and moved to California mm -hmm. and was living um and teaching, I got a part-time job at UC Santa Barbara while I was doing my doctoral dissertation. I actually collected my dissertation data in Santa Barbara. I was working on a project um, describing, a was a phenomenological study of Black families living in a predominantly white community and trying to raise their children with a sense of uh, racial identity, or at least I was interested in exploring how they went about that in mm. the context of a majority white community. So as it turned out, Santa Barbara was a good place to be to do that <laughs> work uh, from the demographics of it. But but I was quite young. I was 26 years old. And, you know, AD, uh, you know, your listeners will know that means all but dissertation. Mm -hmm. I was almost finished with my doctoral program at Michigan but I had to write this dissertation. And while we were in California, I got a part-time job at UC Santa Barbara, initially working as a therapist in the Campus Counseling Center, hmm. uh, because that's my background as a trained clinician. But also I was invited to teach a course in the Black Studies Department. The first course I taught was called Education and the Black Child. And my hmm. research was on the experiences of Black youth and schools and communities. And so I taught that course, it went pretty well. Fast forward, they needed another course taught. And the chair of the department asked me if I could teach this class called Group Exploration of Racism. Mm -hmm. And I, um, that course had been created by a faculty member who was no longer on the faculty. So, you know, it was sort of a homeless course and there wasn't a person assigned to teach it, yet it was a requirement for the major, the Black Studies major. So they really needed somebody to teach it. And he asked me if I thought I could do it. And, you know, looking back on it now was really the arrogance of youth. I was <laughs> like, sure, I can do that, right? How hard could that be? Um, I am the reason, one of the reasons nobody else really wanted to teach it wasn't so much the racism content, but it was the group exploration part, right? Mm. The course had been designed to be very interactive. It wasn't a, le a formal lecture course in the traditional sense, but because of my background as a clinician, I was quite comfortable facilitating groups. So the group part was fine. And I figured, you know, given my research on Black families, I could do the racism part too. And I started teaching this class. And I say all of that to say, you know, I was 26 years old. It was 1980. And I um, found some resources that were very helpful to me in uh, thinking about how to teach the class. But, you know, I made mistakes along the way. At the end of the first semester, I got the teaching evaluations back. Mm -hmm. And the teaching evaluations said things like, 
this course has changed my life. Oh, wow. Everyone should be required to take this class. Why did I have to wait until I was a senior in college to have conversations about this important topic? Mm -hmm. It was so striking to me. And, you know, UC Santa Barbara at the time had a black student population of about 2%. Most mm -hmm. of the students in my class were white. Yes. And they were just, um, they'd grown up in silence about the topic of race and racism, and yet it impacts everyone's life. And the more that they learned, the more they felt that that silence had been a disservice for them. Mm. And they really wanted other people to break the silence as well. So that teaching experience reminded me, or perhaps, uh, you know, back then in 1980, made clear to me, not so much reminding me, but made clear to me that this was really important work, you know, that there were all these people who really needed to have these conversations who weren't having them. And my class had kind of opened up this possibility. And so I thought, I need to do this again. And as it as it happens, uh, the university kept asking me to teach the class. We lived in Santa Barbara for four years. And during that four-year period, because they're on the quarter system, I probably taught the course 10 times. Mm. And by the time we left Santa Barbara and I was, you know, looking for a tenure track position in a psychology department, the first tenure track job I had in my interview, I was asked what I might like to teach. And of course, they had some standard psychology courses they wanted me to teach, like, you know, child development, theories of personality, those kinds of things, which I could do. But then I said, well, you know, if I get to teach something of my own, what I'd really like to do is teach this course, in addition to that stuff, psychology of racism, how would that be? And the chair of the department said, he was pretty blase about it, which seems odd in today's world, right? Mm -hmm. But back then it was like, if you want to, right? You know, so <laughs> that's how it began. And it be, just became sort of a signature course for me. And what was really striking, because of my background as a psychologist and my interest in racial identity development, what I started to observe in my classes was patterns of behavior on the part of white students as well as um, black students and other students of color that really mapped onto my understanding of racial identity development theory. Mm. So it was that observation, that set of observations that led me to write an article which was published in the Harvard Ed Review back in 1992 and really kind of set my career on a whole nother track. Now this is kind of a this is kind of a teacher's to teachers question, but how consciously did you try to hide that article from your future students? Because it kind of would give away <laughs> the, the whole process. Uh it is. Well, it's true. It kind of does. But actually, I started requiring the, the article mm. early on. Yeah. Um, I did two things at the beginning of the semester. Um, well, let me rewind and say that at the when I first started teaching, one of the seminal texts that I used was a book by David Wellman called Portraits of White. Of race. Yes, yes. I've read yeah. the book. Yeah. It was, well, it's a fabulous book. I mean, it's quite old now, mm -hmm. but the, um, it, but for those who haven't read it, it was based on, it was basically interviews with white people about their attitudes about um, prejudice, discrimination, racism. And what David Wellman found in his interviews was that most people said they weren't racist and in fact disavowed racism as an ideology, um, didn't didn't acknowledge their, didn't want to acknowledge or didn't feel that they had prejudices, but yet they often uh, talked about the way social relationships were organized, you know, schooling and housing and all of that in such a way as to defend their own racial advantage. Mm -hmm. And it was really David Wellman's definition of racism that I that I really liked and used, um, which was to define racism as a system of advantage based on race. Mm -hmm. And that people who don't think of themselves as racist will still defend their advantage using other explanatory strategies. And so that book was a great book to use in my class. But what was really exciting about the book was in the back of the book was the interview schedule 
Mm -hmm. that he used with his white interviewees and still teaching in predominantly white environments until I came to Spelman. I was always working in predominantly white environments. Um, my students wondered what they would have said. You know, they read the book and then they said, you know, it's really interesting. I wonder what I would have said mm. if somebody had interviewed me. And so we brainstormed about how we might recreate that experience. And so I modified David Wellman's questions, updated them, and uh, made them usable whether you were a person of color or a white person. You know, I modified the language so it wasn't an assumption that it was just white people responding. Um, and I gave the questionnaire to my students at the start of the semester and asked them to interview themselves. Oh, using, interesting. You know, using a back then technology, using a tape recorder, today you do it on your phone, right? But um, I asked students to interview themselves and turn in their tapes at the beginning of the semester before they read anything about racial identity development theory. Wow. And then I um, collected those tapes, but I didn't listen to them. I just kept them in a box. And then early on in the semester, they read my Harvard Ed article about racial identity development theory. And then I asked them to listen to their tape later in the semester and to um, write an essay about their own responses. Mm. By the time they did that, it was toward the end of the semester, they had started to you know, go through some of that shift in thinking that's part of that developmental process. And they described for themselves how they thought they were growing in that way. Wow, what an incredible tool. And I mean, one, it just demonstrates your willingness to experience uh, to innovate. I wanted to say experiment, but, you know, I didn't want it to, to seem in any way pejorative, but to, to really innovate with how to engage as the field itself was evolving, because to some degree, what you're describing is a process where there's, um, you know, sort of once you peel back the veil, um, that creates another kind of self-awareness. Um, yes. One of the things that, that you mentioned in that, that 1992 article talking about race is the problem of guilt, shame, and anger um, yes. as, as initial responses that can lead to denial or other forms of avoidance of this issue. And I won't get into your own um, uh, discussion of the steps that each various groups uh, go through, but I, I want to stop on that for just a moment because one, it, it, I want to tell a personal story about raising my own children. Um, so I have three. My oldest is a son. He's 23. A middle daughter, 21. And the youngest is 17. And I remember my oldest son watching the uh, a news story about Henry Louis Gates being arrested in Cambridge. This is yeah. several years ago, 2009. And he's having breakfast at the time. And he says to me, he says, uh, Daddy, are white people going to put us back in slavery again? Now, it was totally unprompted by anything but the news story. I, we, we weren't having a conversation. Um, I wasn't imposing a perspective on him. Um, but, but it was a very powerful question uh, to ask. And of course, I, I talked to him. about it. it was an invitation to a conversation. The second experience I had many years later with my youngest daughter, she was about seven or eight. And I, in this case, I did want her to see a documentary called Black's Black Power Mixtapes. It was a film made by Swedish, Swedish filmmakers of the Black Power era. And there's a lot of original footage that had never been seen. Angela Davis, the Black Panthers, many other aspects of the movement at that time. After the film's over, she looks up at me and she says, Dad, I don't want to be Black anymore. It's too hard. Mm. And I thought about those uh, moments in revisiting your article uh, from 1992, because part of what you have done in this body of work is to say that this guilt and shame happens for everyone. And it's the, I mean, I, I'm putting words in your mouth, but here's an invitation for you to jump back in, which is to say it's normal, right? It's, it's part of the process of children gaining awareness about race and racism. Yes. And it's one of the things that is so um, frustrating about this moment in those places where legislators are saying, 
you know, don't talk about it. It's making people uncomfortable, right. you know, uh, and there's so much to be said about that. But no, no, keep going. Maybe, I mean, we're a little, maybe, I was going yeah. to build to that, but we can jump right in. No, no, but I, 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 I say this because it is predictable and it's what you, I hope you get in the 92 article and in the other things that I've written is that, yes, there are moments of discomfort, but there's also a lot of joy, mm -hmm. right? And the joy comes, you know, weeping remains in the evening, joy comes in the morning, <laughs> right? The, um, the joy that people have, I mean, those students in my UCSB class experienced discomfort in the beginning, in the middle of the semester. At the end, they were like, everybody needs to take this class right? They were, you know, so excited about what they had learned, even though there was discomfort associated with it at certain points during the course of the semester. And I think when we, and there was also, I, I, the word that comes to mind is anger, you know, white students angry at their parents and earlier teachers who didn't tell them, like, why didn't you tell me this? Why didn't I learn this? Uh, frustration about that. And so, you know, when we have folks today saying, don't talk about this, it make, it's making my kid feel uncomfortable, they are not understanding that that's part of the process. It's not the end. Yeah. So this is, this is a moment to sort of historicize where we are today. So just to get it out there, more than two dozen states have passed anti-CRT laws, anti-woke laws, divisive concept laws, any number of laws to prohibit yeah. discussions uh, with any truthfulness or honesty about race and racism or sex and sexism or, sexism or non gender conforming people, fill in the blank. Um, but I'm curious, you almost paint a picture going back 40 years ago to 1980, where there is seemingly far more acceptance in higher education. You've not described parents uh, organizing on the footsteps of the uh, college campus, denouncing you as indoctrinating their children. Mm -hmm. So how would you characterize um, the early years, the early decades of this work in terms of resistance to it? Well, I certainly had students who didn't like, you know, so there were students, I have taught in different contexts. So let's, I was at UCSB. My first um, tenure track job was at Westfield State College, now known as Westfield State University, which is part of the state college system in Massachusetts. I taught there for six years and then moved on to Mount Holyoke College. But, um, but while I was at Westfield, there were some students who took my class because they had to not because it was a course requirement, but maybe they were, I had, for example, criminal justice majors um, and someone in their criminal justice program said, you need to take that psychology of racism class or, you know, that kind of thing. So not every student was in the class completely voluntarily, though it was an elective as opposed to a campus-wide requirement. And some of those students did not like the content, you know, uh, felt disagreed. Um, I had one student who's quite memorable to me, who said at the end, you know, it was a young white man who said, you know, I have learned a lot. I see that I am advantaged. That is okay with me. <laughs> right? you know? like, it's working for me. Why do I want to change that? Right. <laughs> um, and so, so this is to say, you know, and at the same time that I was doing that work with undergraduates, I was doing a lot of professional development with K through 12 teachers mm -hmm. in schools all across Massachusetts and beyond. And sometimes I would be leading workshops at a school where, you know, the superintendent said everybody has to be there, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was mandatory. And, you know, some of those educators not... Um, happy to be in the room talking about these things and, you know, asking uh, of provocative questions and, you know, trying to be disruptive, you know, that happens. But having said that, but generally speaking, I think the, um, the climate was one that was much more open and receptive to learning. And, you know, to put this in context, 
politically con political context, in 1997, when Why Are All the Black Kids was published the, for the first time, was the same year that Bill Clinton, who was president, launched his president's initiative on race, hmm. you know, and said uh, publicly that we need to be having this conversation. And um, he, the first public town hall forum that he did when he was launching this initiative in the fall of 97 was held at the University of Akron in Ohio. Hmm. And there were uh, three authors invited to be part of this town hall meeting. And I was one of them. Hmm. He'd read my book. I got invited. It was very exciting for me, of course. Um, but, you know, there he is on the stage talking about why he thinks it's important for us to have this conversation. And he, and he says, it was his second term. And he said, you know, people say, why should we be having this conversation now? And he said, you know, things are, you know, things are going well. The economy is good. You know, we're not at war with anyone. We weren't at that time. And, and he said, that's exactly why we should be having it now. Mm. Because, you know, it's an opportunity because things are good, because the economy is expanding, because we are at peace, we have the bandwidth, to use that term, to really engage with this difficult issue. Fast forward to today, we're in a political climate where, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, in the Trump era, I'm going to use that phrase, mm -hmm. in the Trump era, it was all about, you know, don't talk about that, you know, the leadership was moving in a very different direction. Yeah. Right. Leadership moving in a very different direction. The last thing I want to say about it in terms of what's different now is that if we track a sense of progress, let's say in the late 20th century, early 21st century, not in every way, right? Progress, not in everything, but I was born in 1954. If we use 1954 as our starting point, today is a different time than 1954 was in some ways. Schools are as segregated today as they were in 1954, but certainly access to opportunity, particularly for um, middle-class Black people with educations is different than it was in 1954. And, um, if we understand that as progress, I look back at what uh, Dr. King said in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And he talks about the fact that after every period of progress, there's pushback against that progress. And so as much pushback as we feel, it suggests to me in a kind of odd way we must have been making a lot of progress because there sure is a lot of pushback right now. <laughs> it's a great point. I mean, I've made the point using a kind of uh, a physical therapist uh, as as a metaphor, meaning that, you know, if I have an injury and I've been um, told to go see the physical therapist, that injury is not going to heal uh, without the physical therapist working the muscle or the site yeah. of injury for a period of time. Um, and over time, it gets better. So a lot of pain in the beginning, less pain over time, and eventually, uh, you know, a healthy, a healthy body. Uh, it seems to me that that your point about the backlash in this moment is one measure of the effectiveness of this intervention. You yes. know, this this conference is designed around inviting people like you who have a wealth of experiences about forms of truth telling. Um, in this case, the importance of racial literacy or racial identity development in a healthy way to recognize the world we live in is actually shaped by racial categories. Um, you use a term early on to make a distinction between the aspirational goal for many whites, in particular of color blindness, which you say is not only not the case, uh, because that would suggest a deficit in vision for people, right. but actually color silence. 
-hmm. that that children are constantly told not to talk about these things. And given the backlash and given the resurgence of a notion of colorblindness, it is animating 2024 presidential politics. Most of the people on the right um, or in the Republican Party are calling for colorblindness because that is the American way. That is that is American exceptionalism. That That is what we stand for. That's, that is the country we have. So talk to us about what is the science of racial identity development for young children. And, and, and to be very practical in, in this response for people listening to this conversation, when is the age appropriate time to talk to children about racial identity formation? And what are the just broad sketches of the best ways to go about doing it? Sure, well, let me start by just inviting your audience, we're not gonna be able to see them, but I'm just gonna take people through a little thought experiment here, which is to say, if you, if I asked, if we were all in the same room together and I could see everyone, I would ask people to take a moment and think about their earliest race related memory. Mm -hmm. And if you ask people to do that, you know, in a minute or two, most people will, I, I then I could say, raise your hand if you thought of something, almost everybody's hand would go up. And then I would ask, how old were you at the time of the thing you remember? And people will call out ages and they can range from as young as three or sometimes even two um, to as old as 30 or older, depending, it all depends on where you grew up in your own sort of life experience. But for most people, the ages that are most commonly referenced are like five, six, seven, usually kindergarten, first, second grade ages. And if we, um, so I ask people to think about that because when we say that, you know, kids don't notice it, well, if you think about your own experience, most people have a race related memory that goes back to early childhood, relatively speaking. So it's, you know, if we just use that as our universe, we know that most people are having some awareness of how race is playing itself out, even if they don't understand it. If you ask also what emotion is attached to the experience, it's very common for people to say things like uh, confusion, fear, anger, embarrassment, shame, sadness, um, you know, sometimes they say happy, friendship, love. It's not always a negative experience, but most people ask them to think just in that way, think about an early race related experience. will think about something that has a negative emotion attached to it. Mm -hmm. And then I like to ask, okay, so let's imagine you're five, you're six, you're having this experience. You can remember it decades later. Um, you remember the feeling attached to it. Did you talk to anybody at the time that it occurred? Mm -hmm. An adult, a concerned adult, a parent, a teacher, somebody like that. There are always some people who say, yes, they did. But always, the majority of people will raise their hand when I say, raise your hand if you did not. Most people will say that they did not. But, you know, you referenced yourself as the father of three children. If you spent time with five and six and seven-year-olds, they're pretty chatty. Right? right, you know, right. they don't they don't censor themselves much. They tell you all kinds of they ask all kinds of questions. They'll strike up conversations with strangers, you know, the person sitting next to them on the airplane, you know, and tell them all the family secrets. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they um they're pretty even you know shy ones are shy, but um but but it's an age when they haven't learned the social rules about what you can and cannot talk about. So it's a little bit counterintuitive that there would be so many adults who say, I have this early memory and yet I didn't talk to anyone about it right. at an age when that kind of you know conversation is common. So what does that tell us? It tells us that I like to say many people have experienced the, shh, you know, um, imagine this scenario. Let's imagine a white parent with a white child in a grocery store let's say it's a three-year-old, and that three-year-old sees a dark-skinned person, maybe for the first time, if they live in a mostly white neighborhood, maybe that's a, it's an unusual experience. And maybe that child says something like, mommy, daddy, you know, why is that person so dark? 
and does it in that loud three-year-old voice, right? And the um, parent is embarrassed. They've pointed something out. The, the typical response in that moment is Shh, to hush the child, right? It doesn't have to be that. You could say something like, because people come in different colors, right? right? You know, just like my hair's brown, your hair's blonde, you know, people come with different skin colors too. It, you know, it can be very matter of fact and, you know, what an interesting observation. You know, here's a really moment, not uncommon. Uh, that same child, maybe instead of saying, why is that person so dark, might say, why is that person so dirty? Because mm. a three-year-old might think that the darkness is the result of dirt. Um, because a white child playing in mud would get dark, right? I mean, so it's a kind of, but, and then the parent's really embarrassed. Right. But the parent, you know, but that parent could say, of course, that's not dirt you know, that child is as clean as you are, you know, or that person is as clean as you are. People come in different colors. Some people have darker skin. Some people have lighter skin. You could even say something like, there's something in your skin called melanin. Did you know that? Everybody has some. Some people have more than others. The more you have, the browner your skin is. It helps protect your skin from the sun. People who live in really warm places or did at another time, um, often have darker skin because they needed the protection from the sun. People who live in cold places tend to have lighter skin. Um, you know, that's a three-year-old conversation. You can have that. It doesn't have to be complicated. I think one of the things you're emphasizing is that you lean into affirming that the child's not crazy for seeing difference. Yes. And you can build from there. <laughs> yes, yes. So to come back to your point, um, you know, how do we talk about racism in particular? We can talk about racial differences. There is research that um, babies notice, you know, six month old babies notice racial difference. They will stare at faces that are less familiar to them, um, will respond differently. You know, if it's a whatever, whatever they're used to, right, whatever skin configuration they're used to is what they're acclimated to. When they see something different, they will be drawn to staring at that because of the difference. Um, but, and eventually they start to associate negative things with that difference, particularly um, dark darkness, you know, all the cultural things that associate dark with not with negative things that's part of the socialization experience the cartoons you watch the black hat wearers you know all of that um but the parent who wants to reduce that impact the parent who has an ex um, a multiracial cast of friends right um who is part of an inclusive community where there's lots of different people and young children are growing up around lots of different people that effect is minimized, right? Mm -hmm. Because their understanding of who's in my circle, who belongs in my space is expanded. And I imagine that's also class uh, inflected because one could also be say on the Upper East Side of Manhattan surrounded by uh, West Indian nannies pushing white yes. babies in strollers and children are seeing diversity, but they're also seeing power differentials. Yes, yes. There is, I, I'm not going to remember who the writer was. I want to say it might have been Audre Lorde, um, but I may be misquoting, but, you know, gives an example of a white child saying, oh, mommy, look at the baby maid. Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, not funny, but funny. <laughs> yes. So, so let's talk a little bit about tran the transformation part of this, um, because uh, it seems to me that there are age appropriate developmental steps that, as you just described, start as young as two and three. And certainly the science tells us that uh, we have to acknowledge what our children are experiencing in the same way that their bodies will change. And we know that good science tells us that children should be made aware of their sexual, yes. uh, themselves as sexual beings, their reproductive capacities, um, and the harm that they can do to themselves and others if they're not made aware of this. So we generally call this sex ed. Yeah. And so um, I guess to put both clarity in a kind of certain way that the science of what you've been working on for 40 years, it's clear that, that to have a healthy 
personal identity development and to create a healthy society of people who understand who they are and their obligations to each other that we actually have to teach and talk about race and racism at, all along the way in terms of yes. the education and development of children. That's the science. <clears throat> what we know is that, let's just talk about identity for a moment, right? Um, identity is a social phenomenon, meaning, you know, when we are born, we get feedback from people in our environment from day one, right? Oh, so cute. Oh, so smart. Oh, so pretty. Oh, so, you know, whatever that people are saying about you becomes part of your self-definition, right? And your racial group membership also becomes part of your self-definition in a race-conscious society. That's the important clause here in a race conscious society if we didn't live in a race conscious society it might not be correct but the fact is that people are going to notice and comment um either verbally or non-verbally uh you know you can have non-verbal commenting let's use that um you know signaling the meaning of your group membership so let's say you are a young child in a preschool environment and there are toys of varying racial ethnic description um, some toys will become preferred over others and if you identify with the preferred toys that's part of how you see yourself I'm part of the preferred group if you are part of the group that is not that is devalued either by maybe not even the teachers, but other children. Oh, we can't play with that one. You know, that one's this, that one's dirty, that one's this, that one's that. You know, all of those signal messages, all those messages are signaling to you information about how you are categorized and or people like you are categorized. And if you are um, a white child, you are not necessarily being signaled about your whiteness, but you're being signaled about your, um, that you're part of the norm, mm. right? You know, that the default, right? You know, the, the preferred default is this. Um, if you are a young Black child, I'm going to use that example, growing, let's say, in an all-Black environment, mm -hmm. you're still seeing messages on the television. You're still hearing language that people are using talking about good hair, for example, versus, you know, defined as straight versus um, curly hair, natural kinky hair. Um, the All of this is uh, part of your socialization experience. And, you know, it's, we are bombarded by this information. It's like smog in the air. I sure. write about that. A smog in the air, we're breathing it, not always aware of it, but consciously breathing it. As kids get older, they're able to ask questions and notice and comment like your son did when that incident happened with Skip Gates. Um, he was he, nine at the time, know, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he's observing what how people are being treated, wondering, does this apply to me? That all of that is part of identity development. What group am I in? What's the implication of that group for my future? And um, the more, the brighter, more precocious the child is, the more likely you get those questions very early. But every child is going through that experience, particularly as they approach puberty. One of the things we know um, from a developmental point of view is that today's children are reaching puberty at an earlier age than several generations before, right? It's not uncommon to have fourth graders um, entering puberty. Maybe that, you know, when I was growing up, that was more likely in sixth or seventh grade. But we see that kids are entering puberty sooner. What difference does that make? Puberty isn't just changing your um, sexual organs, your secondary sexual features, but it's also changing your brain. Yeah. And your brain capacity is getting uh, meta, you know, metacognitive, uh, thinking is more part of what you're doing. You're thinking more complexly. And so you're starting to figure out like, where do I fit in this world that I'm observing? And what's the implication of that for me? And as you start to think about those things, you start to wonder, 
well, who else is thinking about these things? Who else around me shares these questions? Who else around me has answers for me? What are my peers doing or thinking? One of the things that I often heard teachers talk about when I was working with a lot of K through 12 teachers is that the kid who was apparently oblivious to racial group membership, the, the kid of color, apparently oblivious, not thinking about it at one grade could go away in the summer and come back completely transformed. Yes. You know, all of a sudden dressing a certain way, talking a certain way, wanting to, um, carry the symbols of their racial group membership as they've defined it. And, you know, leaving the teachers scratching his or her head about, you know, what happened to Jamal? Uh, <laughs> well, he's developing, his identity is developing and that's what you start to see in adolescence. Yeah, so I have one Matt, one final question and then we're gonna take a couple from the audience. Uh, and so let me just get that out. This is a big question, but, but um, I think you 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 have it. So let's just imagine what you just said is a brief that you've just delivered to a Senate hearing on the crisis of of race in America, and you've just testified with essentially what you just said. Here is what the science tells us. Talk just briefly about what you've seen as a leader. Uh, someone who has led two very significant institutions of higher education, a predominantly black one, a predominantly white one, and someone whom I'm going to assume over the years has had an ample opportunity to educate uh, school leaders from superintendents to state commissioners of education, as well as to federal officials. What is required to close the gap between the science of what you've just described and the politics of it. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me, not just the right wing movement against this, there are a lot of people in the middle who are either too afraid, too unwilling, or too unlearned themselves about the actual science of this to take up this work in a way that would represent a much more vigorous defense of it rather than what I see which is primarily silence and yes. fear. Yeah. I want to say a word about the silence and the fear for just a minute, which is to say, you know, that there are places we know, we've read it in the news, right, of where, you know, the, the teacher who speaks up, the teacher who's reading the book in class, you know, next day is fired, right? You understand that the stakes are higher, perhaps, in this moment than they have been in the past. And I want to just acknowledge that. Yeah. And that I was only speaking of leaders, only leaders, not the yeah. not the people who have no power. Yeah. Well, even the leaders worry that they're going to get kicked out, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> as we just saw with the House of Representatives, right? Um that's true. Good point. But, but the um but my what I want to say is that people, you know, I think there has to be a certain commitment to exercising some courage, right? You know, we just have to talk about courage as part of this conversation. That said, people have more authority and can claim more authority than they typically do. And it doesn't have to be as complicated as people make it. I like to, um, if I have a particular superpower. I don't know that I would call it a superpower, but if I had one, I would say it's putting things into very concrete terms that people can understand. Mm -hmm. And particularly when we're talking about the importance of representation in the curriculum, the importance of truth about the history, will the truth about the history of slavery, for example, make white children uncomfortable? It might, they might feel guilty about that, but it's also important to let white children and children of color know that not everybody was an enslaver. There were people who spoke up against enslavement or enslavers who 
came to an awareness that this was wrong and they shifted. Um, they did something differently. That in every time period, there have been allies. There's always a choice, right? There's always a choice to um, be complicit or to speak up against the injustice. And so that's, you know, we, so we just need to make the whole range of choices available. Mm -hmm. And if we only talk about, you know, this horrible thing and those victimized people, the kids of color don't want to be seen as only victims. They want to also know about the rebellions, the the, the agency, the ways in which people spoke up. And, um, but all of this is to say representation matters. And so I have found that the best example when I'm talking to people in that Senate room, I would start by asking people to imagine that we are taking a group photograph. Let's imagine there's gonna be a group photo of everyone in this room. And when that photograph is taken, each of you is gonna get a copy of it as a memento of this occasion. What is the first thing you are gonna do with your photo when you get it? There's only one answer to this question. And that is look for yourself, right? right. You're gonna look for yourself in that photograph. But let's imagine that someone has digitally removed you. Mm. You were there, the picture was taken, you were smiling brightly, you know, looking good in your outfit, but now you've been digitally removed from that photo. So you get your copy just like everybody else does. But when you look for yourself, you are missing from the picture. Yeah. You would wonder at first, what's wrong with this picture? But let's imagine this happens repeatedly. Many pictures are taken. Every time they take yours out, you were digitally removed. You get your copy. You're not in the picture. You are not going to say, what's wrong with this picture? After a while, you're going to say, what's wrong with me? Why mm -hmm. am I never in this picture? I was there. I remember it. Why can't, why am I, why am I not showing up in this picture? The leader has to be the one who says, who's missing from this picture? And what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't feel good to be left out. Yeah. Right. Most people can identify with that. And not only does it not feel good to be left out, but it impacts what you aspire to. It impacts what you think is possible for yourself. It impacts your, you know, speaking as a higher ed leader, it impacts whether you're likely to complete your degree. You know, the sense of belonging you have is going to be determined in a very fundamental way by whether you feel like you are being included. Yeah. Well, if you're my 17 year old daughter, then you want to be out of half the pictures that I take of her, not because she doesn't feel included, but because she doesn't like the way, the way she looks. Well, you want to be in the picture looking good. And that's I think right. that's important. You know, it's important yeah. to say that because that's the other thing. Sometimes kids of color are in the picture, but they're not looking good. Meaning, right. you know, uh, I used to teach child development and I did a study. This was now years ago, probably, you know, almost 40 years ago, but I did a study with a student who was working with me as an independent project where we did an analysis of the photographs in the child development textbooks. Where do you find pictures of kids of color in the child development textbooks? Well, back then you found pictures of kids of color in the part of the book that talked about um, fetal alcohol syndrome. Oh no. Wow. No, I'm, you know, the, the happy picture, the normal development, all white kids, you found the kids of color in the pictures having to do with deviance in some way. Yeah. Yeah. I quick, quick anecdote on this. And I'm going to read a question from Ashley King. When I was at Indiana University in the mid 2000s, um, you know, it's a very white campus, a very white place, but a wonderful institution for me. I, I thrive there. And so I have no critiques of the school in that regard. But I stumbled upon the writing um, pamphlet for students to seek writing help. So it was the writing center. And it gave all these examples about how to write a good thesis statement, again, at a school that's overwhelmingly white, 90% white. And one of the examples was something like, if you want to write a good thesis um, and your thesis is um, crack babies grow up to have poor negative outcomes. 
I was like, whoa, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Not in this white place can we use a crack baby thesis statement as an opportunity to engage students on their writing skills. Yes. So I wrote yes. to the administrator, I got that changed. And, you know, so I get your point about the the way in which the entire air we breathe, the infrastructure is seeped with these negative associations. Yeah. So Ashley King um, might get our, our last question from the audience. Um, she says, what can white women do specifically to help other women of color in the workplace? How can we halt the harm being caused and redirect it to lifting behaviors, I guess, positive behaviors, and any framework or steps for that dynamic to lay the foundation? Well, I think what, if we're talking about ally behavior, and certainly that's what I think the question is speaking, like how can white women be allies to women of color? Um, and that is to name let's start with who's in the picture, right? Who's being included in the picture? Who's being invited to in the meeting to bring a point of view? But to do that in a way that doesn't speak for those women, mm -hmm. but speaks, but creates space for them to speak for themselves. Yeah, that's a great, great response. So we have a, a question. You probably get this all the time, um, but I'm going to ask it from, from a guest in our audience. What resources... Uh, would you recommend that people can use to develop more understanding of the science of racial identity formation? Well, I'm going to start. your own wonderful body of work. <laughs> right, right. Well, I was just going to say, if you haven't read the most recent version of Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race, I would certainly recommend that. I do sometimes encounter people who read the 1997 version. Mm -hmm. and um, And I really want to highlight the fact that the 2017 version has a lot more current information um, and you know the psychology or, um, the understanding of racial identity development has only evolved over time mm -hmm. so it's worth the effort to read a more current version in my yeah. humble opinion uh, but having said that there are a lot of um, good resources there's a wonderful book which isn't specifically about racial identity development, but it is about social psychology and its uses in terms of creating a sense of belonging in the workplace, in um, in school for sure. It's just a really fabulous book and it's titled Belonging mm. by Jeffrey Cohen. Uh, and it's just a masterpiece of social psychological literature in terms of looking at the ways in which we can do what he calls situation crafting. I love that phrase, but he talks about how small things can cause big impact in terms of how someone experiences an environment. And uh, and there are lots of very tangible examples in the book, so I would recommend that. So I think we'll have uh, one more question here. Uh, I'm going to read the question as it is written, and then I'm going to take a stab at, uh, I think, interpreting it as I understand it. So the question as written is, can you both comment on how race consciousness and discrimination in our society is part of a historical and dominant culture that paints all kinds of otherness as less than across our wider cultural and political sphere? Um, so I really think it's a question that uh, we sort of, is the backdrop to everything that you've been working on. So. I'd like to reframe the question Please. Uh, and say, what exactly is going on with, say, people of color, Vivek Ramaswamy or Glenn Lowry or other black commentators or people of color commentators who think that you and I who speak about the importance of racial literacy are the ones who are discriminating or take the text of the Supreme Court decision that essentially makes the same argument as a basis for getting rid of affirmative action. Yes. Well, let me say that there have always been multiple perspectives on this issue. And I want to give a very concrete example. Um, my dissertation, which I described was about Black families in predominantly white communities, um, was looking at how, and it turned into a book, the book is called Assimilation Blues, mm -hmm. Black Families and White Communities, um, was about how did families socialize their children around issues of race to affirm their identity as young Black people. And what I found was that there were three strategies. Um, 
there were parents who were what I called race conscious, who talked about it, who made sure that their kids were part of a social network of other black children, not exclusively so necessarily, but they thought it was really important for their kids to have part of, to be part of a black community, to reinforce in positive ways, that sense of identity. I call those people race conscious. Then there were people who were race neutral. And I call, and these were people who said, you know, it would be nice, but I, you know, they were laissez-faire about it. I'm not really, it would be nice if my kids had that opportunity, but we live in this mostly white neighborhood and they don't really, and, you know, I'm I'm just too busy to do anything about it. You know, it's not that important. And then there were people, a very small number, but there were people who said, you know what, it's not important. Hmm. My, um, and the people who said it's not important tended to take what I called a class conscious perspective. They said, you know, my kids are with other kids of a similar class background, economic, socioeconomic background. The fact that they're the only Black kids in the room is okay. It doesn't matter. Um, and I was intrigued by this difference. And I wanted to know what difference did it make to the kids. Mm. And late research years later, I had the opportunity to interview Black youth who'd grown up with different kinds of family approaches. The, the kids who grew up in the race conscious families were much more self-confident in their sense of identity. Mm. They encountered racism, but could name it when they saw it and they were not defeated by it. The race neutral ones came, were more anxious, you know, less self-confident in that sense of identity. The, the race uh, avoidant is the term I used. The ones who didn't want to talk about race at all were the most distressed. Mm. Um, and the reason they were the most distressed was because they were having experiences of racism. They were having those experiences, but they couldn't name it, felt they weren't supposed to talk about it. It was like, you know, they were in college experiencing depression around this inability to name or engage with conversations about it. Fast forward, you know, the Glenn Lowry's of the world, the Vivek uh, Swami person, you know, I'm going to mess up his last name. Um, um, you know, their own experience may be that they don't see the ways in which racism has impacted their lives or don't want to talk about it, find it too painful. You know, I don't want to, you know, do a little armchair psychoanalysis here. But, Although you're you're probably good as anyone to try. <laughs> <laughs> but but what I can say is that there are lots of examples of folks who don't want to name it, don't want to claim it, but who later find themselves in psychological distress because they don't know how to navigate it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I just want to say that it was very affirming to have you here today. Uh, to remind us uh, that we know what the problem is. We even know how to fix it, at least a good chunk of it in terms yeah. of individual efficacy and the capacity to be better human beings and global citizens of the world we live in. Now, if we could fix the leaders uh, who need more courage and or um, ability to empathize with the victims of this problem when they themselves may not be victims, um, that will have to be a conversation for a future forum event. So Dr. Beverly Tatum, I am so very, very grateful uh, for all that you've done for your leadership in this field as a scholar and both as a higher education leader. Uh, we are grateful for you and look forward to more from you. So you, you stick around. We're going to need you uh, in the months and years uh, to follow. I have a couple of things to just say, uh, a little bit of housekeeping as we close out the conference. Um, and I just want to quickly say to one of the questioners, yes, history is a data point. Historical data and history itself can be used as data. That's a question someone asked. So that's answered. But additionally, I want to encourage all of our attendees to take a five minute survey about the conference. Uh, and so you'll get a notification in your email for having registered for this. So please fill that out. Also, as a thank you, we're raffling off three signed copies of my book. Uh, I guess um, maybe we'll try to get some copies signed of yours and extend the raffle. Uh, so please use that as incentive 
uh, for filling out the survey. Uh, you'll be anonymy, anonymously, or I should say, you'll be randomly included in the raffle for having completed the survey and get a copy of the book. And with that, I just want to say, feel free to, sh to hashtag, uh, share and tag us on Twitter at IARA underscore HKS and LinkedIn, hashtag truth and transformation. This has been an incredible event. It's our fifth one and it gets better with time, although more urgent and more necessary, it seems as the years pass. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Tatum. Very grateful for your time this evening. Thank you for your leadership and thanks again for inviting me. Thank you. Good night, everyone.